Well, hello and welcome back. Today we're talking about Karl Barth, who was almost undoubtedly the greatest theologian of the 20th century. Now, it's said by almost all theologians that the beginning of the 20th century theology begins in 1919 with Karl Barth's Epistle to the Romans commentary. That commentary, it's often said, dropped like a bombshell on the playground of theologians. And what that means is that Karl Barth quite severely undid the project of liberalism in his new theological method. Karl Barth's main opponent is going to be Schleiermacher and the whole liberal tradition. And Karl Barth will align himself with Kierkegaard's main idea. In this quote, he says, if I have a system, it's limited to the recognition of what Kierkegaard called the infinite qualitative distinction between time and eternity, and to my regarding this as possessing negative as well as positive significance. God is in heaven and you are on earth. The relation between such a God and such a man, and the relation between such a man and such a God, is for me the theme of the Bible and the essence of philosophy. One of the inspirations for Karl Barth is going to be the atheist Ludwig Feuerbach. Feuerbach was a student of George Frederick Hegel, and Feuerbach writes the essence of Christian religion in which he basically says that Christian religion undoes itself. And the whole trajectory of Christian religion leads one to atheism. Bart is going to be very interested in that book because he finds something significant there and it'll be a fuel for his theology. Let's place Bart then between the theologians that we've already covered. Bart is clearly against Schleiermacher. He's very clearly against liberalism. He sees Schleiermacher as the beginning of the problem. He says that Schleiermacher is trying to speak about God by speaking about man in a very loud voice. But Bart is also very critical of Charles Hodge and all fundamentalist kind of traditions. For Bart, the Bible will become the Word of God as God acts through it. The Bible in itself is not the Word of God proper. It will become the Word of God as the Word, the Son, speaks through it. And Bart is definitely going to shatter the idea of revelation being propositional truth because Revelation is God himself making himself known to us. In the middle, there's a dependence on Kierkegaard that I think can't be missed. Bart himself acknowledges that, as we saw previously. But here, we could go a little further. God's transcendence, holy otherness, and human sinfulness means that all our thoughts about God ultimately end in confession of mystery and acceptance of paradox as a sign of mystery. Bart is going to emphasize that we can't know anything about God by ourselves, that both our sinfulness and our finiteness will prevent us from knowing God in any natural way because God is infinite and we're finite. These are all themes that Kierkegaard has been emphasizing and Bart takes them over. Now, it's interesting that Bart began as a liberal himself. He studied under the great liberals. He was a student of Adolf Harnack, and he begins his career as a pastor in a little town called Safenwell, Switzerland, where he begins with liberal theology. But that just doesn't seem to work. There's a couple of problems. The people of Safenwell just aren't buying this liberal kind of theology. And so as Bart makes sermons every single week, he's forced to go back to the Bible. And he sees more and more in the Bible that liberalism just didn't seem to get for him. At the same time, his great teacher, Adolf Harnack, sides with the Kaiser in starting World War I. And Bart is amazed by that the complicity of the Germans in going to war. He says, if that's what Christianity leads to, and if that's what Christian society leads to, then I don't want anything of it. And so Bart says this, an entire world of theological exegesis, ethics, dogmatics, and preaching, which until then I had taken to be fundamentally credible, was thereby shaken to the foundations along with whatever else was to be read from the German theologians. 
Bart undergoes quite a shock. And so he begins with a new idea, a new kind of theology. As Bart becomes more and more discouraged about theological liberalism, he reads an atheist named Ludwig Feuerbach. And he finds something in Ludwig Feuerbach that seems to him to be very important. It's a good diagnosis of the modern condition. Feuerbach's basic understanding is that theology is anthropology. And what he means by that is that theology is man talking about man in a very loud voice. Well, theologians say that they're talking about God. In fact, what they're talking about is an ideal image of themselves. Let's try to understand Feuerbach's thesis here. He says that religion is our first way of looking at the world. We're naturally religious as we grow up. Little children think of God, they think of mystery, they are naturally, naturally religious. So it's kind of the childlike condition of humanity. And if we look at all the ancient cultures, they were religious. This fits Feuerbach's thesis. What he says is going on is that we project an ideal image of ourselves outside ourselves, and we call this image God. Let's look at the history of religions. He goes back and he says the early religions were polytheistic. Let's take Hinduism, for example, the earliest of the religions, a polytheistic kind of religion. And he says, these polytheistic religions all over the world in all their forms begin with nasty little gods who are like human beings. They fight with each other. They want things. They cheat each other, for example. They're nasty little beings, but they're the ideal of what those ancient peoples wanted to be. But then as time goes on, people begin to grow, they begin to recognize new values, and then religiously they move to monotheism, one ideal being. And it's that ideal being that is like the projection that we want to be of ourselves. If ultimately we as human beings could be something, it would be like the God that we propose. Just think about the attributes of God, for example. Don't we want to be all loving? Don't we want to be all knowing? Don't we want to be all powerful? Isn't that the quest of the human being? Feuerbach thinks so, and he thinks that's why we call God all of those things. So, he says, then we reach another stage. That is, we put that one God up to a level that that God is beyond knowing. We say this God is out of reach for us. Well, we're just talking about human reflection on God. And he says by that point, we're practically atheists. So we really live for ourselves and not for God. Now, for Feuerbach, he says we ought to embrace the fact that we're really only thinking about ourselves. So here's me thinking about God. And I think of the ideal image of what I would want to be, and I call that God. And Feuerbach says that's what's going on when we're religious. And Christianity, he says, takes one step further than monotheism because it says that God became a man. Now we see a unity of God and man. We recognize what's been going on all the time, and that is that God and man are really one. They're really the same thing. Really, all we were is projecting an ideal image of ourselves, and that's what we've been calling God. So Christianity leads the way out of religion. It leads us to atheism, thinks Feuerbach. Why is all this important for Karl Barth? Because Barth sees exactly that happening in liberal theology. This is Feuerbach's book here, The Essence of Christianity. and Notice here that Karl Barth writes an introductory essay when it's translated and uh, in a later version of the book. And in that, Karl Barth kind of agrees with Feuerbach, and then he gives him kind of a backhanded compliment. He says Feuerbach was right, but real religion isn't what Feuerbach was talking about. Real Christianity isn't at all what the liberal theologians have made it into. So, Bart says, religion is unbelief, because religion is man's attempt to create 
something before God. Religion is always something that starts with human reflection for Bart, and it never gets us to God because it remains captive to us. So yes, all religions are really human reflection. They are projection. Rather, what we need is for God to break through and come to us. And Bart says, Christians, of course, should have already known that. The Bible has already warned many, many times about making an idol for ourselves. And our human projection is what we naturally do. That's why the Bible warns us so many times against it. So Bart says, if we had just read our Bible, we would recognize the problems of liberal theology. We would see that liberal theology is doing what Feuerbach says it's doing, and we would reject both liberal theology and Feuerbach. What we need then is revelation. And for Bart, revelation is God's self-offering and self-presentation. At this point, then, we can compare Karl Barth with Friedrich Schleiermacher. Now, notice that both of them are dealing with the same problem. How do we say anything true about God, given the fact that God is infinite and all that we get at are things of the world, things that our senses can access for us? We could never get at God through our senses. So how can we say anything true about God? Remember Schleiermacher's answer here. We experience God in that depth of feeling. It's an innate feeling that goes beyond and prior to our senses. And then we build religions as we begin to describe that feeling in our concrete social expressions. Now that's going to be exactly what Karl Barth is going to be against. We can define revelation this way, the self-unveiling imparted to men of the God who in his essence is ununveilable to them. That's simply impossible for God to be made known to human beings because God is infinite. And yet revelation is that impossibility being overcome by God. God makes himself known. So revelation is, once again, God's offering and God's self-presentation. God must make himself known to the human being, immediately to the human being, so that we know him from inside. Theology, then, is reflection on revelation. Now we start with revelation, and for Bart, revelation is always an event. It was the event of Christ. So we start with the event of Christ, and we begin to work out language based on that event, and not based on our modern culture, or our feelings, or what our senses can grasp, etc. Schleiermacher would be quick to ask, well, don't you have to show the credibility of that event? I mean, how do you know that you got it right? How do you know that God really became man? Don't you have to show the credibility here in terms that human beings would understand today? And Bart says, absolutely not. Famous quote here, the proof of faith consists in the proclamation of faith. The proof of the knowledge of the word consists in confessing it. There's no way that such an event can be proven. On what grounds could it ever be proven? God is infinitely beyond us. He makes himself known to us. We accept that in faith. And then we begin to talk about, discuss, work out the implications of that event that's taken place in Jesus Christ. Now, it's with this background that we can make sense of all of Bart's systematic theology. The key word, once again, is revelation. As long as we understand that's at the center of his thought, we'll be able to make sense of everything that he's writing about. Revelation. How does God, the infinite God, make himself known to human beings when that's not possible? That's the event of revelation. That's what makes systematic theology for Bart a, a procedure worth working toward. So, this is basically the steps of his systematic theology. The first step is that revelation is the only way to know God. That's the foundational step here. We don't know him through our human experience. We don't know him through our culture. We know him because he's revealed himself to us. We have to accept that in faith, and that's Bart's doctrine of revelation. But we still have to ask the question now, how does this happen? After all, if God is infinitely above us, 
then how do we receive that revelation? And for Bart, God must exist in such a way that he can reveal himself. However God exists, he must exist in such a way that he can reveal himself. Now that means that God, for Bart, must exist as a trinity of persons. Because God must be the revealer, God must be the revealed content, and God must be the revealedness, the one who brings that into our life. The Father is the revealer. He's the one who makes himself known to human beings. God's word, his self-expression, is the revelation, the content of revelation seen in Jesus Christ. And God, the Spirit, is the revealedness, the one who brings that event of Jesus Christ into our lives and animates it us and helps us to live by that event. So Bart works out a full Trinitarian theology based on the idea of revelation. Now we take a further step. Bart says, since God is the one revealed to us in three persons, and because God wants to reveal himself to us as three persons, so God must have always existed that way. God must have always existed with the plan to reveal himself to us. Therefore, Bart works out a doctrine of election. God must always from eternity past have elected us to be with himself in Jesus Christ. So along with electing the Son to be the, re the content of the revelation to us, God elected us to be with him. And so Bart has a full doctrine of election here worked out based on the idea of revelation. Now each of these steps is fairly radical, and I'm sure that each of these steps brings up some very interesting questions that would be good to discuss later. Here though, I'd like to discuss only one aspect of Bart's theology, one that's going to be important for us as we move through the course. It's the idea of the Word of God. Bart takes this from Luther. He says there are it's a threefold word of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. That is the word, the capital W, word of God, the self-expression of God. And then on a step down, there are the words of God. Scripture is the words of God. That's a little W, words. And then the third level, preaching, are the words of God. For Bart, and he's very clear about this, the Bible becomes the word of God. How does this happen? Well, those human words about God that were written by the first observers of Jesus, those who were disciples and apostles, they become the word of God as the word that is Christ uses those words to make himself known to us. How do we come into contact with Christ? Well, we can read stories about him in the Bible, we can read true things about him in the Bible, but it's not the propositions that are revelation themselves. It's when Christ himself, by means of those words, comes down to us, meets with us, transforms us, through his spirit, of course, who enlivens us and works a transforming work in our lives. So the Bible is the medium of the word of God being connected to us. It's that creaturely medium that brings us into contact with the word of God and thus causes an event of revelation to happen in our lives. Remember for Bart, revelation is always event. It's not propositions, it's not truth of some propositional form, it's event. And God accomplishes it by doing the impossible. A miracle happens every time revelation occurs. And the Bible is the medium of that. It's God's chosen means by which God himself breaks through that barrier, comes down to us, and meets with us, is revealed to us as a trinity of persons. That's the event of revelation that Bart is getting at, and that's the center of his theology. It's that which seeks to take down all of liberalism because, as Bart sees it, 
liberal theology is simply man talking about man in a very loud voice.